Is this the graph that you worked on? What's going on back there? Okay, so I just want to talk about the process here and see if you have any questions. So what was the interval size that we want to, so what's, what are we doing? So what's the point? What, what are we doing here? What do we got? What kind, of, what kind of thing is this? What's that? No, it's not a wobbly line. It's a mathematical representation of what? Acceleration? Velocity. Velocity. Okay, it's a speed, and speed in, in general is what kind of quantity? But more, more general, you're getting more specific. Positive. The rate. The rate of change, okay? We've got a rate of change function that's telling us at a given time, like what does a point on this function represent? If I were to pick a point on this function, What, what does a point on this function represent? The rate he was traveling at that time. The rate he was traveling at that time. And so the whole graph is what? What is the whole graph? What does this point mean? It's the rate at that time. It's an associated pair of information. So where does the graph come from? What's that? That's it, Patrick. Bunch of dots. It's all these points, right? It's all these points at di all different times as time increases. If you pause time at any given time, you get an associated rate. And we show all the points. So we so it's too it's too time consuming to, to go dot 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 dot, right? So it's not like a wire, it is actually a bunch of dots. It's actually a bunch of points. That's what this is. But this is just too cumbersome and not very clean to do it this way. So instead, we just show continuously all the points flowing together. So when you see a graph, you've got to see a bunch of points. So these are this is rate of change, right? And what what we're going to do with this rate of change graph? What's that looking? Okay, we're going to use it to build a distance graph exactly. And how are we going to do that? Using intervals, okay? And our intervals are going to be 0.2 wide. So, like the first interval was like from here to here, right? From 0 to 0.2. So, I'm showing that as to be straight. Okay, so this this is the first interval of 0.2 hours, and then we do that for, for all. So this is going to be 4, 6, 8, etc. Okay, so we're breaking up into intervals, and what are we doing in each interval? Reshma. We're seeing how much it changes. Gianna, what are we going to do in each interval? Yeah, why, why, why are we breaking up into intervals? Uh, so we can see. It's not so we can see something. Um, yeah. um, delta Y, so uh, I don't think we did that. John Paul. So we can get a more accurate picture of how far he traveled within that time. Or like he was traveling a certain, certain amount of time at a certain rate. So we get a more accurate picture of smaller than it is. Okay, so um, our goal is to figure out how far he traveled. And the first thing we said to do was going to break this up into intervals. Why are we breaking it up into intervals, Jessica? We're going to assume each interval is at a point. Yes, there's the key. 
we need we can work easily with constant rates of change, right? That's why we, we worked for two weeks on it. Constant rate is very convenient. Changes in y are always proportional to changes in x. So y equals the constant rate times x times the change in x. This is very inconvenient mathematically because the rate is doing what? Changing. Always changing. So we would like to create something similar that's easy to work with mathematically, which is? In each interval, instead of having this continually changing rate, we want a constant rate. We want a constant rate. That's the point. Because if we have a constant rate in each interval, like the tax function, like the rocket basketball, boom, we just crank out, crank out little bits of change, right? We can just crank out these little bits of change. So we have to decide. What do we want the constant rate to be? Should I make it 70 in the first interval? Should I make it 10? What am I trying to do? What's my purpose or my goal in choosing a constant rate? I want it to be like what? Jason? Why not 10? Why not 70? Yeah, so we're, we're going to choose a constant rate in this first interval. Why not 70? Why not 10? Go ahead. Okay, it doesn't reach 70. It doesn't go down to 10. So what about 50? Can I do 50 for the constant rate? Would it be somewhat accurate? Yeah, it'd be a lot better than 70. Certainly a lot better than 10. Yeah, 50 would be reasonable. Why? Because the rate is changing from 30 kind of almost up to 60. So you could use 50. Could we use 40? Sure, we could use 40, right? This is, it's all just, we're just estimating, approximating. So what do we usually do? And what did you do in your homework? In order to choose this constant rate, Ryan, do you remember what you did? To choose the constant rate in this first interval? Not sure? Okay. Kyle? Okay, so the ending point would be, are you saying here? Yeah. Okay, so what is this? This is the function value, the true rate of change, where? At This is right. This, this would be x of point 0.2. Is this the right side of the interval or the left side of the interval? X point two. It's the right side. Do you see? Is it a valid approximation for the rate? If I were to do that constant rate at point at the up there around fifty eight, it's valid. Is that what we, is that what was the instructions in this one? And what did it say? The left side. So we look at the interval, which goes from zero to point two. And we're going to look at the left side of the interval. And so, Allie, what will the constant rate be if I'm using the left side of the interval? 30. 30. So here's the actual rate on the left side of this interval. So that's what I'm going to choose to be the constant rate for the whole interval. And this is where we're starting to form our step function. Okay? So what is step of point 0.1? If the function is called step, what would step of point 0.1 be? Brian? 30. What would step of point 0.19 be? 30. What would step of point zero zero one be? 30. 30, right? It's a constant rate for this whole interval determined by the rate at the left side, the actual rate at the left side. Does that make sense? Okay, so here... Um, from 0.6 to, in this interval, from 0.6 to 0.8. Eric, tell me how to determine the constant rate from 0.6 to 0.8. Uh, it was the um, delta x from 0.2. Okay, so 0.2. to 2. How do I get this constant rate? How, where should I put the constant rate? Okay, can you, can you say it, in, in, not in terms of an estimate, but in terms of how you're getting it? Oh, well, because um, it's the interval between 0.6 and 0.8. Right. So take the left side. Left side? The left side looks like it's 15. Left side.
like you're saying here. Yeah. We want the actual rate at what value? 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. We're going to pull off the actual rate at 0. 0.6 because 0. 0.6 is the left side of the interval. And so then what will step of 0. 0.78 be? Is it 0.6? Is that our rate? Yeah, I liked your estimate. 15 was a pretty good estimate. So what's step of 0.77? And what's step of 0.8, uh, 0.62? And step of 0.7? Okay, every x value in the interval gets assigned that constant rate according to the actual rate at 0.6. Does it make sense? Okay, so when you do that, so if you did the right sides, it's okay. I mean, you got, you worked it all through. You did a lot of things correct. It's just you just started with the wrong assumption. But does it make sense choosing the left side or the right side to determine the constant rate? We can also choose the midpoint. So, for instance, we can choose the left or the right. So, for point this interval from point four to point six, <coughs> the midpoint is. 0.5. So we can take the rate at 0.5 and let that be the constant rate for that whole interval. It's a valid way of doing it. It's a valid way of doing it. So here it is. I'm choosing the left endpoints, and then I'm estimating um, what that what those rates would be at the left side of each interval. And then, how do I get the, my approximated distance in the first point two hours? How do I get the approximated distance in the first point two hours? Delta x times the rate gives me delta y, right? Delta y times the rate, or is the rate times delta, delta x. So that's my 30 times 0.2. So here I'm, I'm building the, the distance function, an accumulation of distance every 0.2 hours. So here's my 0.26 is my 0.2 times 30. And then it accumulates, right? So after 0.4 hours, I have the 6 that I've accumulated from before plus a new 11, which is the 0 0.2 times 55. Then I take that, and I'm going to add on the accumulation in the next 0.2 hours. 6 plus 11 plus 5.8, which is that right there. Okay, and so every time I keep adding on a new little chunk of distance, so the distance is accumulating, and here's how it accumulates. So this, here's my number of hours, here's the distance traveled. So did, did you get about 60 miles in two hours? Some, some of you are not, nodding, great, okay. So your numbers will be slightly different because your, your approximate, the way you approximated these rates will be different, okay. And if you actually accidentally or misunderstood and used the right sides, it's okay. You still sh should get um, something in the ballpark of six, something between 50 and 70, okay? All right, let me, ask, let me offer you to ask questions. Does it kind of clear up some stuff? Any questions, please ask. You also then were to graph this. So basically, you're just plotting points on the x-axis time, on the y-axis distance traveled. And so then this graph is going to do something like this. Is that what it looked like? And I'm just, you know, it's, it's, the, the distance traveled is always increasing. Why? Because we always have a positive rate of change. But it's increasing kind of at a varying rate. Are there any circumstances in which you would use the other endpoint? Other, uh, like for those intervals, like the other side, like the yeah, side it's it's um, unless instructed, it's our choice. So there, there there are just yeah. So there are different ways to do it. There's nothing more correct about estimating with the left side of the intervals or the right side of the intervals. Uh, am I asking answering your question?
There's nothing more. For this particular problem, I specified that you should use the left. That's the only reason why you use the left, just because I specified it, just to, to see if you understood. But there's no, no ad, ad advantage to the right over the left over the mid. There are just three different ways of doing it. OK, so what does delta say for the first interval? What is delta x? 0.2. And what is delta y? 30 times point. So it's a rate times the change in x. OK, how can we see that on this graph? So on our distance graph. So we got a, what is this right here? Or the, yeah, so this right there is our change of delta x, 0.2. And where do we see delta y? Boom. Corresponding change delta y is 0 0.6. Sorry, 6. Did I do that too? Yeah, sorry. Thanks. 6. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Yes, I guess I was just confused because in the bacteria example, okay. you had the the changes uh, for each bar represented bacteria as uh, delta B. No, that would be the delta Y. So delta B would be the change change in our quantity. Those would be like delta Ys. I was showing the B, so in the table that I made, are you talking about the table on the video? Like when you were actually doing it on the graph, right. you were writing delta B. So on this, I was writing that as like delta D distance. Yeah, the, which would all be delta oh, Ys. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so in that case, it was also time. So our time was our X, and changes in time would be delta X. In that case, the quantity is bacteria, so our delta Y is delta B. And here our delta Y is delta D. Yeah, totally. Other questions? OK, problems with this. Just the overall method, this overall approach. What are problems, disadvantages? Lizzie. Well, because it's using sections, it's like assuming that all of the values are consistent. OK, so in, in the gist of what you're saying is? Yeah, it's not accurate, right? Because from the start, we're changing the rate of change function. We're making it convenient to, to do some calculations, but that changes what the actual rate is. So like in the first in the first point two hours, did the distance travel change six miles? Trevor, did it, did it actually change more or less than six miles in the first point two hours? Why more? Yeah, we kept it way down. In fact, a lot more. You see this? It's it, there's a there's an acceleration here. Okay, so and we assumed that for that whole time he was going 30 miles an hour. So this this is a, kind of grossly inaccurate. That first change. And if we had picked the right side, then what? Our estimate would be way too high because he was the whole time going slower than that. Okay, yes, totally inaccurate. Other disadvantages. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so that goes back to the idea of, in, okay, so yeah, so inaccurate, our, our intervals are big. And so if we make the interval smaller, how does then our step function compare to the actual rate function? If we make the interval smaller. So let's see. Let's do it in red. So I'm going to do, so I'll keep with the left, and I'll just kind of, Go fast here. So now I'm just kind of winging it here on a smaller interval and still using left sides. What's true about this new step function compared to the old one? 
How does this step function compare to the actual rate of change? Yeah, do you see how this, <coughs> how the, the red step function is matching the rate of change better? You see, much better, because I chose a smaller interval. Okay, so now, want to do it? Want to work out the distance traveled profile? For, why not, Kyle? That's a, lot of it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Here's the trade-off. You want something better? You got to do a lot of work. But you live in a good age. Why? You live in a good time. We have machines. We have machines that can do this. So not only can we have a better, we can choose a good uh, rate of step function to match. We can have the machine do it quick. So that's what we're going to work on next. Okay? That's what. So I wanted you guys to bring a graphing calculator. Let's get graphing calculator to do this for us. And then what, we, what can we do to delta x? If we have it all, having the machine do it, then we can make delta x what? Really small. Not infinitely small. We still, it still needs to be a finite interval. But we can just, with a click of a button, we can make delta x much smaller. And our accuracy is going to go up in terms of the distance traveled. The accuracy will start, start going way up. So are you saying that you can't say if it's really small, you can never get to um, uh, we can get it so close that our, we can't tell the difference. How about that? Yeah. So that's something we want to think about. We just want to do so well that we wouldn't know the difference. But it's still going to be small changes at constant rates in each change. Okay? But so good that we can't tell the difference. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Okay, so let's just, again, this idea of finding that the x value at the left end, um, we're going to practice that. So if you have this sheet from last time, do you have this sheet from last time? Go ahead and get this out. Anybody need a new copy? Anybody else need a new copy? Okay, so if you, let's go ahead and close your notes and flip this over. We want to kind of re think through it again. So we don't want to, so I, I kind of gave you the formula at the end of class, but we want to think through it one more time. Yeah. I don't know how, if I can. They don't, none of them are on? Is there anything on the wall? Can you reset? Here, I don't know if this will help, but yeah. that'll breach. Okay. So we want to kind of just think through it again, what we're doing here. What are we doing? So the whole key to this is finding these, finding these x values on the left side of the intervals. Finding these x values on the left side of the intervals. We've got to tell graphing calculator how to do that. We're going to set this up so it can do that, that step function, we got to know how to tell graphing calculator to be able to do that. So let's just practice here. So here we are. Then here are the elements that are involved in this. You've got your starting, your starting point of the interval, which is we're going to call A. Okay, this is A. And I've set A to 0.75. Okay. Then you have the width of each interval. I've set that right now at 1.8. 
Okay, so this is the value of n. And I've set that at 9.23. So the question is, and this is like our x, okay? This is like a given value of x. And the question is, if our x value is 9.23 starting at 0.75 with intervals of 1.8, where what is that x value? What's the x value of the left side of this interval? Do you see how this relates to our whole discussion so far? We got to find these left sides of the interval. So we we just take we randomly say, okay, what if x were here at 9.23? I've got this setup going, a starting value of 0.75 and x equals 1.8. What interval am I in? What x value is at the left end of that interval? Okay, so figure it out. And if you, once you have it, raise your hand. So everyone, by yourself, work on it. Once you've got what that is, raise your hand. And our goal is to get a general formula for this. Okay, so I'm not asking you to, to reproduce this graphing calculator file right now. Okay, we're not quite there yet. I'm just asking you to think about the mathematics of the situation. So we'll get we'll get to graphing calculator very shortly. So just work on this. You're trying to get what is the value of the x value at the left side of the interval that we're in, right here at 9.23. Everyone's working on it, okay? Writing, pushing button, time to calculate or something. Everyone's thinking about it, doing it. And then when you get it, raise your hand. So, so write down your approach. So if you got it, write out, write out your thinking that got you the answer. Anybody have it yet? Just one. I'm glad we have to doing this again. It's really important that we can get this. You got it too. So we got three people. Keep working on it. Four. Okay, if you have a question, ask me. People have the value of the red dots. Raise your hand, nice and high. Okay, we're getting some more.
Drill it into you. Well, you guys want you to talk through what you did. You got it? You good? Yeah. Ellie, you got it? You guys get it? Delta X is good, point zero five. No, it's one point eight. Delta X. We're just trying to find out. That's seven point five. Seven point five. That's not. It's like seven point two. I'm not asking you to just plug into that formula from last night. I'm asking you to think about solving this. Then how how is if this is the x value nine point two three? How can we mathematically get this number four from the nine point two three? Because we can't tell the computer count the number of intervals, right? We need to do it mathematically. So if you were given this number nine point two three, how could you have a formula that would tell you that that was the fourth interval, the fourth left endpoint? Oh, you need to be able to. So give it a shot. Just give it a shot. What's that? So we know we're at 0.75 here. How are we going to find the x value here? That's what we're saying. Everything by 1.8. What's everything? Okay, so we've got a distance from here to here. You want to divide by 1.8. What will that get you? How many 1.8s are in that? And did you get four? I got four, right? I mean, more than four, right? Up to four because we, we want to be at that whole number right there.
Okay, so how do we get the, the whole the point of this is there's there's four intervals, right? This is the magic number in this example. The magic number is four. So we need a calculation given 9.23, 1.8, and 0.75. Given those three values, we need some way to get that there are four intervals. How can can you explain how do you get how do we calculate a number out of those three numbers that results in we get four intervals? Yeah, Patrick. I did the ending point and 9.23. 9.23. I subtracted 0.75. Okay, stop right there and tell me what that quantity, what what does that represent? Just that difference. What kind of quantity is it? Um, is it an area? Is it a volume? Is it a miles per hour? It looks like a distance. Yeah, it's just distance on the x-axis, right? Mm -hmm. So what distance is it? It's the distance from? Start to end. So if you take n minus a, we get the distance from the start to where we are. Okay, keep going. And then I divided it by the size of the interval. Divided by the size of each interval. And why would you do that? What does that number represent? If you take a distance and you divide it by a, su a kind of a sub distance, what are you calculating? We're cutting it up into how many of the sub distances are in that distance. Exactly. We're taking we took got the distance and the length of a sub distance, so we're cutting it up into these sub distances and we're asking how many of those are in there. What is this number? 4.71. And we wanted what? What was our goal? I just want to know how many whole number of intervals takes us to here. How many will it be? If this was 4.71, from A all the way to the end is 4.71, then what to get exactly to this left side will be how many? Four, right? Four. So remember, so last time we talked about this floor function. So if you put a number into the floor function, it returns, or the output is? The, it's the greatest whole number that's less than the number you put in. It's the floor of it, right? The floor, so 4.71. What's below it, that's the, that's the whole number that's right below it. Four. So this is a min, or sorry, n, n minus a gives us the distance of the whole interval. And we divide by delta x to get what? What does that fraction represent now? Then, if I take n minus a over delta x, what is that number? Yeah, exactly. It's the number of intervals of width delta x to get me from a to n. So, but that might be a decimal. So, how do we get the next lowest whole number? We're going to use this floor thing. So, if we take that value and do the floor, this will give us the number of intervals. But we wanted the x value of this. So, but th this was the hard part. This was the hard part. 
So how do we get the x value now that we know the number of intervals? So this thing just calculated the fact that there were four intervals. What we want is this true x value at the end of the fourth interval or the beginning of the fifth interval. So, Eric? Uh, multiply by 1.8. Multiply by 1.8? Yeah. Is that it? And add to Yeah, start at 0.75. And then we're going to go that many intervals. But each interval is how much? Delta x. So you can't, I'm oh sorry, that should be, that should just be A. So we can't just put this in. We're responsible for understanding what it means and where it comes from. You've got to really understand that and be able to come up with it yourself to tell the graphing calculator that this is, uh, this is, um, the number that we want. Okay? Does anybody have a question on that? All right, so let's see if we can apply this. So we can open up a new a new graphing calculator window. So this is kind of a nice function here, e to the cosine x. <coughs> okay, so go ahead and put that in. y equals e to the cosine x. So what are some parameters that are going to be important for us to define here to do this? A. a, okay, so we'll say A equals, and for now let's just, just put in A equals 1, okay, and we can, we can change that whenever we want, and then put a comma. What other parameters are we going to want to assign? Delta X. Okay, so on... Option J. So on a Mac, it's option J. Does anybody know what it is on the PC? I have it here. Hold on. I think it's... Someone have it? If you've got it, say it nice and loud. Um... DX control apostrophe or D type DX I don't know I don't really understand this you, what you can do is you can do so let's just we'll all do the same way we need backslash Delta X all right so this is a so do that backslash, then delta x backslash, and that'll make that whole character string be our delta x. All right, and we can just start that at 0 0.5. It's fine. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to get these red dots. So we want the red dots, those are points. We want them to start where? Where's the first point going to be? One, and then, 1.5. Then, then there's going to be another point at, 1.5. And then the next point, two. Okay, so these points are going to be every 0.5. How do you plot a point in graphing calculator? Now it's been a little while. Anyone remember how to graph a point? 
How do you graph a point? I don't remember. Control 2 gives us this little like vertical vector thing. So for instance, I could I could put in 3 for x and 2 for y. <coughs> and we'll graph a point. Okay, so, or I could put in 3, comma, B, or 3B, and then I could tell B to be many values. If I tell it to be, to be many values, it'll plot all the points, that, such as B is a value. So if you do B, and then do control equals, it's a member of, B is the member of, we want to set up a set. So we're going to let b take on many values at once. So we'll just do the integers. So 0, 1. OK, so you put in 2, put in the first two values that you want, and then hit Control semicolon. And it'll do the dot, dot, dot thing, meaning continue like this, and then do another comma. And let's we could just go to 12. Control equals should give you the, it should work. Oh, you mean for PC? Yeah. Oh, not, yeah, not Try control yeah. shift equals. Anyone got the, a member of sign on a PC? Was it? Control shift E. Control shift E. Okay, see if it works. I'm not sure if that's just epsilon or if that's the symbol that you need. All right, so let's just get this graphing many points here along the line x equals 3, comma, anything, comma, 12. Oh, yeah, thanks. I just don't text. That works. I think it. So what was it for PC? Control shift E. Control shift E is the member of control shift E. Dot, dot, dot is a control semicolon. Okay, so our first task is we want to get the dots on the x axis. So here's kind of the technique. <coughs> Given any value of A, and any value of delta x, can you set up a command line that will, in this case, the first one will be here, and then it'll give us our points every 0.5. So that's your task. Etc. So we're almost out of town, um, but You've got everything you need here. We're going to use A and delta X and do a, a general point. And then what's going to change so that we get all of these points that we want, starting at A with an interval of delta X. So this is your little sub mini task here along our way to building these rate of change, these step functions, graphing calculator. we got to get these the red dots first. So that's going to be part of your homework for the weekend. Is how can I get these red dots to plot that will start in my A value and be delta x apart? Oh, you also have the um, the continuation of last Monday's homework. I said it was the um, using graph calculator to do the generalized piecewise function, I posted a video, okay, I posted a video that helps explain the assignment. So that is um, due Monday.
What I will do is I'll send an email out on Sunday. You must reply to that email with your graphing calculator file attached. Okay? Don't send me your own email. I've got a, another class twice as big as yours. So I just can't be getting separate emails. I've got to get them all in the same email. So look for the email that I send. Once you've got your final version, reply to me on that one and attach it in that reply. And then there's also going to be more to the assignment, this included. So what, how can you make graphing calculator to get these red dots on along the x-axis? Starting at A, delta x apart. Okay? Have a great weekend.